Yeah, so in high school, I actually spent a lot of time playing around with tools like Maya, Dreamweaver, Photoshop. And I think I would have gone to art school, but just learning these tools was so incredibly hard. I decided to major in computer science. <laughs> and uh, so I got to Stanford, and when I started my PhD uh, at the time, it seemed like everyone here was working on problems in big data and machine learning, and I certainly got swept up in that wave. And I finally settled on a dissertation topic around how to leverage data to build better design tools or scaffold the design process. And at the time, there were all of these amazing repositories of design also popping up on the web, like for fonts and interior design and 3D models and videos. Um, but where, where I started was, let's treat the, the web itself as a design repository. And so my dissertation work focused on mining design on the web at scale and allowing designers, web designers, to search through these examples to find inspiration, understand design patterns, understand the space of possible solutions. And so what this allowed us to do was build systems where you know people could search over the web of design. So if you were a coffee shop and you wanted to rebrand your website, you could say, show me coffee websites with maybe large photographic backgrounds to see how people were integrating um, you know, photos into their websites. Uh, similarly, you might be you know, creating a mobile version of your page and you're wondering where should that sign up form go? Should it go at the top of the page or the bottom of the page? And so this is the types of systems that I was uh, building as part of my dissertation work. I was very fortunate enough to be working with an amazing team at the time, and we won a few best paper awards on this work. And we also decided at that time, because people were asking, can, can we use these tools to uh, productize it? And we were able to raise some money from um, Andreessen Horowitz and uh, NEA to actually go and see if we could uh, build this into a product and a business. Uh, but what we found uh, when in the market was that examples by themselves, that's not enough. Um, they actually add just very marginal value. And so while we had a few thousand designers using these tools that we'd built, um, we found that the usage of the tools was very apocal. And by that I mean people would use these tools at, during the first few days of their three week long design project. So um, you know they would be using the tools to do research and competitive analysis, but then you know they would actually go off and create their designs and iterate on them, and they, they, were, they were never coming back to the tool. And so it really felt like we were working on the wrong problem. Herb Simon says, everyone designs who devises courses of actions aimed at changing exi existing situations into preferred ones. And I think the, the important word here is preferred, because at my star startup, we were helping designers understand the space of possible solutions, but it was only when we started to help them understand what was preferable uh, that we finally saw some traction. So, you know, when we built these analytics platforms um, that showed how design features actually correlate uh, with uh, specific you know, key performance indicators like time on site or bounce rate, that was when people started to kind of continuously use data in the design process. And this kind of is borne out in other domains as well. People have similar questions about how to tie design features to performance or preferred outcomes. And so, for example, you know, in mobile design, people might want to know how many steps should a checkout flow take so that they can prevent user fatigue. Or if you're creating an outfit, you might want to say, how can you look smart without looking stuffy. Um, and if you're designing a recommendation engine and using uh, you know, social network uh, as data, you might say, how can you uncover taste and tastemakers in a social network? So 
This is kind of what my research is about these days. Um, and this is kind of what the rest of the talk is going to be about. It's how to use data to tie design decisions to desired outcomes. So let's start by looking at how we can do this for the domain of mobile app design. What's the preferred outcome for a mobile app? Well, app designers care about a lot of things. Um, probably the thing they care the most is that people are able to perform the tasks on apps that they actually you know, want them to be able to perform or do. So things like task completion rate, lower completion time, um, fewer usability issues, building, um, building UIs that are accessible. These are all preferred outcomes. And you know, when we say data-driven design in the space, what we usually mean is A-B testing. And A-B testing is very useful for understanding causal relationships between design choices and key performance indicators. But it, at the same time, it is hard to get statistical significance. So this is um, a recent white paper that was released by a company called Qubit, where they actually did a meta-analysis over 6,700 large e-commerce experiments. And this was mostly in the retail and travel sectors. And they found that 90% of the experiments actually have less than 1.2% effect on revenue. Now, I'm not knocking on AB design because even a 0.4% lift for a big company, that's $15 million. So, you know, that's real money. Um, but this is kind of my point where A-B testing makes sense for large companies. So if you're a Google or a Facebook and you have enough users to run these tests, um, you have enough money to, and engineering resources to actually build out alternatives and deploy them, this is a great way to continuously optimize your design. But what about everyone else, right? What we'd like is to have data um, at scale to help us make decisions without having to be Google or Facebook. And for most designers, they don't have access to this kind of data. Um, the data at their own companies will be small. And you know, while they would like to be using data from maybe other companies to make more informed decisions, um, all of this data is locked away and siloed away within each company. So the, the motivation here in this in this research direction is, can we open source usability and usage analytics uh, so that everyone can learn from them? So I'm gonna present you kind of one solution point in this space. And so we built a system called ZIPT, which stands for Zero Integration Performance Testing. And at a high level, what it looks like is a designer can define different tests or tasks they want done over any Android app in the Play Store. So you can pick an Android app and you can say, do this task on this Android app. Um, and then what Zipped actually does is it will put this test on a crowdsource platform like Mechanical Turk, and it will ask users to perform this task on this app. Um, it will collect all of these multiple uh, traces from all these users, and then it will aggregate that data and provide people with visualizations that will help kind of up-level design insights. Um, so there's kind of two parts to this project, right? You or two challenges rather. Um, one challenge is you have to actually be able to capture this data, and then the second part is like you have to be able to efficiently aggregate this data. So let's talk about how we how we do the capture. Um, the capture was actually done by a system we built called Erica, which allowed us to mine interaction traces on Android apps as they were being used. And the 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 point that I really want you guys to remember is that this re we wanted it to require no modifications to an app source code or binary so that we could actually collect this data from apps that you personally didn't build. And so I wanted you to get a feel for what Erica looks like. Um, what Erica provides is a web application for crowd workers to interact with mobile apps streamed from a device farm. So the apps are actually running on a device farm and a user is using the app through a web application that we built. 
And while users are interacting with an app, what Erica is doing is it's continuously capturing three types of data in the background. Uh, first, it's capturing user interaction data. So it actually knows where you tapped on the screen or you know, what your multi-touch gesture was. It's also collecting the screenshot, so that's the set of pixels on the screen. Um, it's also getting a thing called a UI hierarchy, which you can think of as like the drum tree of an Android app. And what that reflects is uh, kind of the structure of the UI and what are all the elements. And what we do is we actually stitch all of this data together into these user interaction traces so we know exactly how a user went from one screen to the next. Like, where did they click to go to the next screen? We also collect the screenshots at a high enough resolution so that we can actually capture animation effects on playback. So what you're seeing right here is our data being played back as video. Um, and so you can see, like, we're capturing um, those animation effects as well. Um, one of the things uh, as we collected this data that we wanted to be cognizant about was minimizing the capture of people's personally identifying information. So crowd workers are using these apps. We don't want them to give away things like their credit card information, their emails, and things like that. Um, so we provided an interface where we basically gave people accounts to use. Um, and there were some little uh, technical challenges that we had to solve here, like figuring out how to do um, app verification steps. Um, so, so we figured that stuff out. Um, so let's go back. So that's how capture works, and that's the type of data we collected. Let's go back and now talk about how we actually aggregate data over several interaction traces. And the key here actually is that we're going to leverage all of that structure we captured in, in order to do this aggregation pretty efficiently. Um, so for example, let's say a designer uh, put up this task on Zipped where they wanted a crowd worker to uh, log that they ate a chocolate chip cookie on the app calorie counter. Uh, so let's pretend that we went ahead and posted this on Zipped. Uh, we collected user traces, and now we want to actually look at the results. So what I'm going to show you next is kind of the dashboard we provide designers. So first of all, we provide them some aggregate metrics, such as um, the average time on task, uh, the number of interactions, that uh, the average number of interactions that were taken uh, and completion rate. So um, for this task, it seems like everyone was able to complete it. Uh, similarly, we aggregate feedback, answers to feedback questions as, uh, as well. So this gives us more insight about the users and who they are. Um, you know, have they used an Android device before? Have they used the app before? But this is uh, customizable. So as a designer, you can provide these feedback questions. Then we provide this flow visualization interface. And let's, let's look at this a bit more closely. So the goal here is to tell people kind of in an aggregate sense, or tell designers in an aggregate sense, how people actually completed that task. And so what you see in the dark gray is what we're calling the designer's golden trace. So this is how the designer intended someone to do the task on the app. Um, everything else is a deviation from that. So you can tell that even though that, you know, the completion rate for this task was 100%, not everyone is doing this task as efficiently as possible. And the question might be, why? Um, you can also kind of like get a feel for the screens that people are going through on the side. And you might notice that there's a screen that says, hey, uh, there was a problem. Uh, and so this modal has popped up, right, that says there's a problem. So maybe people are experiencing some, uh, some usability issue here where they can't get to the next step. And after you do a deep dive, you can actually see that, hey, it's actually confusing on this screen because people actually had to enter in a unit for a chocolate chip cookie to go to the next screen on this app. And it wasn't clear from the interface itself that you had to do that. 
So this is kind of the, the way Zipped works and how it can be used to get usability insights as well as design performance insights over apps you didn't create. Now let's kind of show you a few case studies. Um, this is one of my favorite ones uh, that we did. Um, so we were here we were trying to compare YouTube music to Spotify music and we were the task we wanted people to do was a simple one. Uh, we just wanted people to create uh, or we wanted people to add two songs to a new playlist that they created. Uh, and what we found uh, with more than 35 users doing this task was that there is a difference between those completion rates on this task. Uh, YouTube Music, only 89%, well, I should say 89% completed the task, whereas more users completed it on Spotify. Yes? Uh, no, 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 no. Go do the thing. What does it mean if they don't complete? Do they give up or does, do they time out? Um, so we're measuring, great question. There's a few ways we're measuring completion. Uh, one is self-report and another one was answer-based. So um, you might have people do a task and produce an answer, like what was the address of blah, blah, blah. And it, as long as they produce the right answer, then they were able to complete the task. But in other situations, they had to self-report that they completed it. Um, but yeah, in this case, uh, it was based on self-report, and uh, here we're asking, so yeah, we were wondering why is there a difference between these completion rates, and we did a deeper dive into the feedback questions that were asked, and it turns out that on YouTube, um, there's not a way to create an empty playlist and then add songs to it. The way you actually create new playlists is you have to go to a song and you have to then say, uh, add to new playlist, and that's how you create it. Yeah. New playlist instead of create a playlist and add two songs to it. And I was wondering, did you try phrasing the question the other way and, and see if these numbers changed? Um, well, this was how it was phrased when we tried it. But yeah, I think it would have been worse if we had phrased it the other way because it would have implied that you had to go first create a new playlist. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we just happened to phrase it this way, but it could have been, yeah, the results could have been worse, I guess. Um, this is actually a known problem in YouTube in the sense I talked to their one of their head designers, um, and I just checked like a few days ago and they still haven't fixed it, so. Uh, <laughs> Um, okay, so the, the, the last example I want to actually show you is a comparison we did between Macy's and Best Buy. Um, and we had a simple task, which was find the address of the store closest to a particular zip code. So you're just kind of looking for the, a near, the nearest, let's say, retail store. And what I'm showing you here is the golden trace that, let's say, the designer would have intended. So, you know, you have to click on the hamburger icon and there's a flyout menu navigation and it takes six interactions to get to the right answer. So here's a case where completion rate is based on a right answer because we're phrasing the task as a question. Um, Similarly, on Best Buy, if you were performing the same task, there's actually two ways you can do it. There's a, there a way, there's a way which uses tab navigation, which is just, you know, on there on the, the, the first screen, or that you can go through a search route. Um, so, a priori, we were thinking that, hey, this is a shorter interaction, and there's actually two ways to complete the task. So, you know, Best Buy should perform better. And what we actually found in practice was that um, Macy's was easier for people. Um, and it's interesting because I think five years ago, everyone was telling me, don't use hamburger menu icons. They're hiding all of the, you know, capabilities. Uh, you should just make it more clear to the user what you can do on an app when you're on the home screen. But now people are just so used to this design pattern that if you don't use one, you might end up confusing users. Um, so it's kind of interesting how you know these design trends might change over time. Um, and I, the reason I said people actually found this use easier was they actually self-reported it being easier. Um, I think a lot of people on the Best Buy got confused by the search 
uh, experience because you had to be in the right search mode to actually search for stores and not products. And so we saw users who are trying to search for store locations in the product search search bar. Um, so let's take a step back and talk about what are the implications of the system. Well, uh, we're you know, giving a way for people to test earlier in the design process, right? Because you don't have to go out and build out all of these different design alternatives. You can actually leverage existing apps and you can run tests on them. And when you are designing your own flows, you can kind of take the things you've learned as best practice from running your tests and use that knowledge to design your own flows. It also gives you a way to do comparative design testing at scale. So if you wanted to you know, compare uh, a Best Buy app to a Macy's app, uh, right now the only kind of service out there that you can use is usertesting.com, um, where they will actually video uh, you know, a user, take a screen video of a user using an app to do different tasks. And it's around $50 a user. And the reason it's around $50 a user is because someone has to manually go through and then annotate those videos and figure out like what's happening. Um, in our case, because we're collecting kind of this structured data about interaction, um, it's easier for us to automatically aggregate this data and to surface um, you know, insights about it. Uh, and then finally, the, the thing that is interesting about Zipped, I think, is the way you can combine different types of quantitative and qualitative findings and use that to inform each other. Um, you know, you can first find that there's a problem and then you can say, you know, why is that problem happening? How can we fix it? Um, so I think this is a, this is a testing form where you can both figure out the how and or what and the why. Now, I, um, I think there's one important thing that is not yet exposed in this testing interface, and that is higher level design semantics. So all of the design descriptions we've collected um, are very low level, right? I showed you a flow visualization, and the reason we're able to do those is because we've understood that two screens are basically the same. Um, but what we want to really understand is like across apps, when are you know, two screens or two flows basically the same? When are people doing search interactions? When are people doing checkout interactions? When are people um, you know, clicking on an article? Like we need to understand those higher level semantics. So kind of the next step in this work is actually uh, figuring out what these design semantics are and also being able to automatically identify them um, in the traces. So in order to actually do this work, we had to collect a data set big enough to where we could actually use it to understand, first of all, what are the most common UX UI concepts in mobile apps? And then second, uh, you know, can we build automatic methods of detecting them? Um, so we released a data set called Rico, and it uses the same capture technology as Erica. And so actually, I would love if you guys, um, if you had the time later this week, check this out, because um, we really are hoping more people use this data set. It provides interaction traces for around 10,000 Android apps, which means um, more than 70 2,000 unique UIs, um, which is approximately 3 million UI elements. Um, and so we use this data set to first identify, you know, what should be uh, a lexicon of UX concepts. And we coded 73,000 potential icons and 130,000 text buttons that were in this data set. And by... Um, Potential icons, I mean images that are small and squarish that appear in the, in the UI hierarchy. Um, and we use this to basically identify around 180 concepts, UX concepts. And if you're curious about the lexicon, you can also check it out at the URL on, the, on that slide. Um, there are some interesting patterns we found where certain concepts are only usually expressed as uh, text. So you can have things like login and subscribe. You won't ever find 
icons for these concepts. Um, similarly, you can have icons that are roughly synonyms, such as um, you know the pencil type icon and the plus sign usually signify an action like create. Um, and then finally, you can even have icon polysemes, which are interesting because these are icons that can have slightly different meaning depending on the context. For example, the star um, in a context could be used for rating uh, and in another context can be used for favoriting or bookmarking. Um, so we leverage this icon to, or we leverage this UX lexicon to then create an automatic approach for a, uh, for identifying design semantics in Android apps. And so we built this code and vision-based approach where we identify 25 UI component categories, 197 text button concepts, and uh, around 99 icon classes. So given a screenshot and a UI hierarchy, we can produce um, the semantic version of that UI hierarchy, basically. Um, the tricky bit in this pipeline was actually the icons themselves, because for a lot of the other a lot of the other types of components, you can use um, basic code-based heuristics, and they work pretty well for Android apps. But icons are again very hard to differentiate just from images. And so we actually trained a convolutional neural net um, that detects between these 99 classes of icons. And we also use anomaly detection at the end of the pipeline so we can differentiate between icon classes as well as just other content-based things um, where it's just a small image. So I want to show you some of the, the classification results. Um, it's cool because the average icons you produce for the different classes really show that they're, you know, people are very consistent with the way they design icons. Um, and I think this is why the uh, you know, machine learning algorithm is able to learn something. Um, but you can see that there's also some variation in each class um, where you know, people do take their own stylistic, uh, you know, they, there's some room for style, basically. Um, so once we had kind of these element-based semantics, what we wanted to see is, can we bootstrap higher level semantics based on these element level ones? And uh, so for example, can we understand screen semantics was the question. And what we did was we trained a deep autoencoder to basically capture semantic, uh, to see if we can capture semantic uh, properties over screens. And what we were able to do is show that, hey, if you train an autoencoder with those semantic versions of the screenshots that we produced, we can actually learn a space where if you do nearest neighbor, squ nearest neighbor queries in the space, you get back semantically similar screens. So if you query with a login screen, uh, you will get back other types of login screens from other apps. So these, none of these uh, nearest neighbors are screens from the same app. Just even though they look so similar, they're all from different apps. Similarly, we wanted to see if we could do um, you know, flow semantics. So a flow is just a sequence of screens where someone is doing a particular semantic task. And the great thing was we were collecting interaction data. So if someone clicks on a search icon, right, you kind of know that they're about to start a search flow. Um, so we kind of used that as our heuristic. And we went through the traces and we basically used our design semantic classifiers to identify, uh, basically annotate different flows. And so we take the flows in the RICO data set, and here you can see that you know, we can identify where people were, for example, doing filter, because we've, we can detect all the places where they were clicking on the filter icon. Um, you can check out this database at o.design. Um, I'll just make a plug for that. Uh, <laughs> URL. I know there are a lot of URLs. Uh, I'll make a plug for that URL because for uh, for a limited time, uh, Google is sponsoring this work, and uh, um, we can crawl all of these uh, flows for free for you guys. So if you want, you know, 
us to go crawl like 5,000 more apps, just request them on the, on the platform. Uh, uh, and on that note, I also want to come back and say, um, you know, we've focused on using Rico for specific types of applications. Do you have a question? Yeah. Okay. Have you thought about combining the flow detection with your kind of online usability testing to kind of detect interesting design patterns and then see if they're actually good and then be able to say that is a design pattern because it works well and it works well across several sites or something like that, several apps. That is, I mean, that's precisely why we want design semantics, right? Because um, right now we're doing kind of these low level comparisons and what we'd love to do is say something like an effective onboarding flow has five screens. So we need to be able to say onboard, you know, what is onboarding for that? And um, you're absolutely right. Like we haven't done that step, but that's, yes, that's what we want to do. <laughs> um, but yeah, like I, I think the other thing is we're obviously not going to be able to get to all the applications you could, you know, possibly work on with this data set. And so I again wanted to encourage people to try uh, looking at the Rico data set. And there are a lot of interesting projects that have already emerged from this data set. Um, at UW, they used Rico to understand and improve accessibility on mobile apps. Um, at Google, they're using uh, it to understand and material design adoption. Um, I know some folks are working on modeling brand perception um, as well as training generative models on this data set. So um, again, this is my plug for the data set. <laughs> okay, so let's uh, switch kind of gears and talk about how these data-driven techniques that I've been talking about in the mobile design domain can also be applied to something that seems very different, right, which is fashion. Um, one of my main motivations of, of, you know, for choosing this as a domain is uh, actually a consumer one, which is uh, apparel is actually a $3 trillion global market. Um, and it actually dwarfs automotive industry, uh, advertising, consumer media, and mobile phones combined. So, I mean, just like that scale is pretty impressive. Um, but, you know, the way we shop online <laughs> hasn't changed at all. Um, you know, I'm sure people are familiar with these screens where you have to like choose what you're looking for, which could be pants, and then you have to like apparently choose the, the length of your pants and what type of hem you want, and like who knows, right? Um, and so, you know, the, the gold standard in the space in terms of user interaction and user experience is actually working with personal stylists. But not all of us can afford to do that, right? So uh, recently, there have been companies who are looking at how do we democratize the personal stylist experience uh, with AI. And St Stitch Fix is one of those companies. So they have stylists that use data-driven interfaces or engines to actually make recommendations to their users. Um, our question kind of in the space is, do you really need the middleman, right? Do you really need the humans who are using the AI interfaces? Can you give AI interfaces to the consumers directly? And if you do, um, how can you make it easy enough or you know, how can you make the user experience good enough so that people will be willing to do this? Um, the hard thing in this space is actually the fact that <laughs> the space is just big. So if you look at the possible types of fashion problems and the possible interventions you could design, it's just really huge. You might want feedback in an outfit. You might want help creating an outfit for an event. You might want seasonal item recommendations and so forth. Um, People are doing amazing work in computer vision and machine learning to build all of these different types of models, like ones for compatibility, for image parsing, for detecting trends. And at the same time, there's also um, all of these data sources out there. Every e-commerce you know, site is a data source, basically, in this space, as well as the other social networks and media that are out there and the editorial content. So there's just 
you know, a lot going on in this space. Um, and so we wanted a way to do need finding in this space and understand at scale kind of where should we focus. Um, so to that end, we uh, built an experimentation engine platform and it's kind of a fancy way of saying Wizard of Oz chatbot, but I'll explain to you uh, why I'm not saying just Wizard of Oz chatbot. So the goal here is that this system is not the product itself. This is just a proxy system and we're using it to learn. So we're using it to learn what are the problems, what are the important interventions. Um, it, it's also going to help us ideate in terms of what are the right types of solutions. And then at at the end of the day, it also provides us a way to deploy ML algorithms and be in a tight feedback loop with users. Um, and so these are all the properties we want. And I know Wendy Ju has been working on similar systems, um, and she calls hers need finding machines. So that's another word you might hear out there. Um, but they're they're very similar. Um, and so we built this Facebook Messenger bot initially that connects users to one-on-one -on -one sessions with stylists. And we uh, released this bot for three weeks. Um, our stylists were uh, Fashion Institute of Technology students, so they weren't experts, but they were they were still more knowledgeable about fashion than, let's say, the average consumer. Um, we advertised on Facebook and Instagram, and we said, hey, are you looking for free fashion advice? Ping this bot. Um, and through that mechanism, we collected 88 organic styling conversations with 73 uh, unique users. Now, there's actually a lot of convergence in terms of the types of problems people wanted solved. Um, definitely, the main problem everyone had was being able to describe a context for which they were trying to dress. So they were trying to go to a wedding and they wanted to, you know, something to wear to that. They were going to a conference next week. What should they wear for that? What should they wear for an interview? So these questions around context really matter to people. Similarly, uh, people also have a hard time with matching things. So if they're creating outfits, they don't know what goes with gray slacks. Um, and then finally, people actually came on and used the bot to just do product search. So they would say, um, I'm looking for a pair of boots. Um, now, e-commerce sites already support this type of interaction, but it's interesting that people would still come to the bot for this because um, one could hypothesize that people are just overwhelmed with the set of choices that they're given through search engines and they're never provided kind of justification about whether, you know, why one set of pair of boots is better than the other pair of boots. Um, we also studied the interaction patterns that the stylists were using in order to address these questions. And so the most interesting pattern to us was the fact that they were using these multimodal responses. And by multimodal, I mean they use images and text. And so you, people just never throw up an image and say, hey, this is my recommendation, right? People always give an image and then explain why um, it kind of fit the the requirements the user was looking for. Similarly, uh, they use the same pattern when they're trying to help users kind of refine their own problem. Because if someone comes to the bot and says, I need shoes, like there are a lot of types of shoes out there, right? So you need to then ask questions and show examples to help users refine um, their problem enough so you can actually help them. And so they use the same multimodal pattern in both contexts. And the word code switching is on that slide because it's a very important one in this context, apparently. Um, when people talk about fashion, they use different languages, like experts use different language from uh, you know, the average consumer. But the, the thing you have to realize is that the expert still needs to communicate in a way that the average consumer can understand. So even when they have all of this expertise and knowledge, they have to you know, kind of translate between the two languages. Um, and we saw this happen all the time. 
So this kind of like set up the set of design requirements um, for basically if we wanted to ever automate this, like this is the stuff we probably need to satisfy. And so this is kind of the first set of design requirements we've arrived at. And now I'm going to walk you through um, a deep architecture that we design based on these requirements. Um, first, let's talk about how this deals with compatibility. Um, so there's a part of this uh, architecture where we've trained a visual compatibility model from 70,000 uh, fashion outfits. We actually got these outfits from a social media site called Polyvore, which unfortunately no longer is up. Um, they took it down this summer. Uh, but before they took it down, we were able to mine this data. Uh, <laughs> and we will, it, it is available. We will make it available so you can also use it. Um, but basically, at a high level, uh, how we did this was we wanted to satisfy that. I mean, there, there have been people who have been modeling compatibility in fashion. But the insight we had was that if you only train one embedding in this space, you are necessarily requiring things um, that match a thing to be similar to each other, which is not always true. So for example, two shoes that match the same top are not necessarily similar to each other. P things can match for different reasons. And so the insight here for us was, let's train multiple embeddings so that you can allow for things to match in different ways. Um, the other point we, uh, the other requirement we cared about was it being multimodal. So what we did was we took the visual embedding from the compatibility model and we trained a uh, neural regressor basically to map the visual embedding to 1300 text concepts in fashion. And we created that vocabulary of text concepts as well. So that, that wasn't something that was just out there in standard. Um, and then finally, we also cared a lot about code switching, right? Because I said there's some vocabulary that's used by experts and some that's um, just so low level, um, or sorry, so there's some language that average consumers use. And this, this is really interesting because it, it's been studied by fashion theorists for a while. Um, so Roland Bart, you know, wrote in his uh, the language of fashion like what makes a sweater smart is it the fact that it's you know uh, a sweater because it's silk because it's white because it's square neck like what are the attributes the low level features of fashion um, that makes a sweater smart um, and so this is kind of the problem or the this is the kind of thing we want to learn or capture and our first attempt at this was uh, training polylingual topic models. Um, I won't get into this in great detail, but what we were able to do is basically express every outfit as a uh, distribution over topics, and each topic could be expressed as uh, a set of style words or a set of uh, low-level element words. And it powered interactions where people could give um, a bunch of text describing what they wanted, and they could get item recommendations for them. So this is something where someone describes, you know, they're looking for something for New York Fashion Week, um, something for a yoga retreat in Colorado, um, something for a tropical beach wedding. Um, so you can see, like, it's getting at important low-level attributes that might matter to these high-level design requirements. But the thing we found was that, um, you know, the inference here doesn't really work when you have small documents. And so uh, in, when we looked at the chatbot data, we saw that consumers are not you know, fond of being verbose. Um, so this was not <laughs> a very scale, you know, this was not appropriate for um, the types of interactions we wanted to support. The other thing was um, this approach also doesn't let you really capture the nuance of fashion where people really want a grasp over, you know, things that are very specific, like cowboy or uh, nautical or something like that. Um, so going back to our deep architecture, the way we're able to kind of support um, more nuanced fashion is we have a two-step training process. And in the first step, we're actually you know, learning the distribution over all the concepts, the 1,300 concept. And in the second step, we're going to actually um, 
use that first step as pre-training, fix those hidden layers, and then train one neuron per concept. Um, and this actually really helps with the, the, the terms that have low frequency, basically. Yeah. Um, it's for tr tr learning the mapping between visual features to um, text. Okay. Yes. And vice versa. You can, you, yeah, the, the neural net will regress to text, yeah. So it's mapping. Um, so the thing that this points out is that if you add in step two, for a lot of concepts that are kind of on the tail end, you get higher activations as a result. Whereas if you just stop at step one, you can see you never really you know, activate. Um, so let me kind of show you some results of this model just to give you a sense of what are all the different types of vocabulary we have. So we have the type vocabulary, which is just like what kind of item it is. Uh, we have shapes and silhouettes like, you know, maxi, skinny leg, ankle. We have patterns like leopard print, uh, floral, plaid. Um, we have at the same time, though, these really higher level concepts and styles like biker, smart, bridal, party, beach, and so forth. Um, and then the cool part is that because we've kind of categorized the vocabulary by these, um, these types of different words, uh, we can kind of start constructing explanations to recommendations. And this is where all of this was kind of like leading, is that we wanted ways to not just show people images, but to actually explain to them why they were being shown. And so we can say, hey, here are evening gowns. And the reason these are evening gowns is because, you know, they have a maxi or a midi silhouette. They have plunging asymmetric necklines and a fluted uh, or also a fluted silhouette. So here we're able to use the other words in the vocabulary to actually provide um, justification for your recommendations. Um, it also allows us to basically go through um, and do other interactions that could be useful, like getting the you know same look for less. So Zimmerman dresses, you know, usually cost more than a thousand dollars, but guess what? There are other brands that cost less than that, which have the same kind of bohemian, floral, tiered ruffle uh, look. Yes? So, so yes, the, gen the way we're generating those sentences we, is we have some templates right now of sentences, and we're basically doing a Mad Lib style generation where we say, insert, uh, you know, a material word, insert shape word, and you can, um, and the reason we actually chose this method is because if you look at the copy on a lot of websites for fashion, it is very templatized. So uh, future work is how do you auto-generate the whole sentence, but right now we can kind of fake it with this. Um, and then the final example I'll show you is uh, one of my favorite ones, which is like we can use this method to create capsule wardrobes, which is a trend in fashion these days as a way to organize your closet. So the goal of a capsule wardrobe is to take a slice of your wardrobe where you're minimizing the number of items by maximizing the number of outfits. So you could create a capsule for summer, or a capsule for winter, or a capsule for your vacation, things like that. Um, and so we can generate these capsule wardrobes using that compatibility um, portion of the model as well and kind of give you sample outfits and explain why they work. Um, so the stage we're at right now is let's, uh, you know, we've built this model. Now we want to go back and re-release basically that bot and see if we can take some of the traffic or some of the questions and hit it with the model. And when we know we don't have a way to answer that question, we would then send it to the stylist and then use that. Again, the goal is to get into this iterative loop where we can understand if these models are actually um, you know, providing value to the user. Now, um, in the last like two or three minutes, I want to tease my uh, the third domain. Uh, I know I don't have a ton of time, uh, but it's it's still a really interesting one, and it's around social media and social networks and recommendation systems. Um, 
curation has become the central activity on social networks because you know you see users sharing and promoting content in a network and everyone then benefits from the network effects so definitely in these systems you're incentivized to identify who are top curators and i won't get into the details of the algorithm we came up with but i just want to motivate how we kind of define or frame this problem we want to find people in the network who have discerning taste, high activity, and timeliness. And by timeliness, I mean people who have found things in the network before it, they become kind of socially popular, right? Good curators are first to identify the good stuff. Um, similarly, they have discerning taste because they, um, you know, they don't like everything. They only like the things that are going to be good. Um, we built this algorithm for identifying curators in social networks, good curators, and then when we actually applied it to study different networks, what we found was that um, it's interesting because on some networks, the people who are you know, adding content, who are creating content, are not always the people who are the best at curating content or who participate in curating content. So for example, on GitHub, um, the the best cre the best creators are usually like people like companies whereas the best curators there are individuals on github where they're not adding code to the database but they're just looking at how they can um, identify code that will be useful to other people in the future um, and then you know since we can talk about identifying these taste makers, um, we started looking at how do we actually mine taste itself from social networks. And, you know, honestly, a lot of networks where you're being served ads, you're not, the signal you're giving the network is actually doesn't contain your taste. So the thing that makes all of this really hard is you actually have sparse user data that you're working with. Um, our answer to that was, can we use um, a system where we can incentivize people to leave more clues about what they like? Um, so we built an emoji-based social media, and I'll try to demo this really quickly. Uh, Yay, that worked. Okay, um, so yeah, so for example, okay, so the, the, the way this works, it's called Opaco. You can leave reactions to places, but at the most you can use only five emoji. Um, so let's leave a quick reaction to like Stanford or, or we can even be fancy and say Gates. Uh, okay, so I'm leaving a reaction to the Gates Computer Science Building. I'm giving a talk. Hopefully I'll be meeting people and I am, uh, you know, starstruck. Uh, <laughs> um, and I'm, you know, going to share this to Facebook because why not? Uh, and I'm posting. So, okay, so that took me a few seconds. Uh, okay, a few seconds. Uh, <laughs> but now I've just communicated that, hey, um, you know, I go hang out and give talks at, you know, good universities. Um, that's part of my, you know, taste profile. Now, suppose I was in the area and I was following some people, right, who, um, yeah, so these are like reactions people have been leaving around Stanford. Um, so uh, someone got their Lexus fixed. Um, cool. Uh, okay, but suppose I, I'm, I'm, I really need coffee, so I can actually then search for coffee. Um, let's see, this is uh, somebody in Ikea. Okay, maybe I don't trust that, but suppose I want to do coffee and work. Oh, okay, this person was also working at Ikea. So, um, okay. Uh, oh, I guess <laughs> five months ago I was at Blue Bottle uh, doing work. Anyway, um, so that's that's kind of how you can use Opaco. Our, um, you know, we're at a thousand users, uh, about a hundred monthly active users. We most of the users are in Urbana-Champaign, but you know that's why I'm demoing it here, so we can build up the user base here. Um, but honestly, the goal is to see is if emoji can be a good way to both capture, you know, get, incentivize people to leave these lightweight reactions, but then turn around and all like actually understand your taste and provide you useful recommendations. So that's that's a long term goal. We're still at the let's grow the user base part. Um, OK, so, you know, 
looking forward, there's kind of just three things I want to leave you with. One is um, I've been talking a lot about design data sets, and there's an important distinction between design data sets and I think just other data sets out there, which is that, you know, on ImageNet, for example, if there's a red panda in the photo, like it's always going to be a red panda in the photo. But in design, what you are trying to capture, it changes over time. So like trends change, um, what you know modern means in design changes all the time. But even the language itself, you know, changes over time in fashion, in mobile apps, everything. Um, the other thing I want you guys to think about is how do you take these different uh, design processes. One is like in product design and one is in, let's say, machine learning design. How do you actually put them together to have a effective data-driven design thinking process? I think we have it. I think that's a very open problem still. Um, and then the last thing is, you know, I talked about how important it was to correlate design choices to performance. Then the step after that is predicting performance. So given a design saying how good it is. Um, and then once you know what is kind of good or what those preferred outcomes are, you can use that data to actually start generating. And like just to tease you guys, um, you know, imagine these interactions where a designer might start designing a login, you know, screen, puts down a logo and a login with Facebook button. But then, you know, this tool can actually suggest all these different ways to resize those um, elements on the screen and add the missing elements. So really think of it as a way to autocomplete design. Um, I think that's kind of the, the future of where all of this stuff is heading. And hopefully it's an exciting future. Um, this is my data-driven design group. Uh, and I want to thank you all for your time and happy to take any questions.